Okay, hello everybody, including our Zoom people. We have about uh, 50 people joining us on Zoom. So thank you for being here. We'll try and look at you from time to time. Ajahn and I are a bit kind of old century, 19th century? 18th. 18th century. <laughs> so we're a bit confused about all the videos and the, the speakers and where to look, but it's lovely to see a lot of people here as well. Um, so a really, really warm welcome, and especially to the Venerables. I think at least four of you, or maybe five, are from the Oxford Buddha Bihar, all of you, wonderful. So they are local bhikkhu sangha, and I'm the local bhikkhuni sangha. <laughs> and Arjun Brown is see, blowing, semi local. Blowing, blowing from overseas. Unless I do something with your passport later. <laughs> <laughs> so he's visiting to support our project, Anukampa Bhikkhuni project, which many of you may know about. Uh, to try and establish the first monastery for fully ordained women, but all people, but where women with the aspiration to ordain can actually come and take up the training. And hopefully anyone here can come and visit because there'll be tons of space and trees and beautiful breeze and who knows, whole forests maybe. So anyway, I would like to first welcome Arjan. Thank you. And thank you once again for being here in England. It's always the highlight of the year, really. And then I recover by being on retreat in your yeah. monastery. So. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here, even though this is Oxford. Because <laughs> my university was Cambridge. Yeah. I try to keep it quiet because the Cambridge University Buddhist Society, they didn't invite me this year. That's true. They didn't really have a very well-formed Buddhist society. Yeah. Except in Oxford. No, I think it's just because they know I've been here a few times. So I think I'm blacklisted. No, you get only get blacklisted for good things, like we won't say. Anyway, anyway good, okay, very anyway, good. Anyway, introductions over and warm welcome <laughs> once again, including to our volunteers who are just coming in. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about the right approach to jhana. Ajahn Brahm usually finds out his talk title a little bit in advance, but you had some time today yeah. and some homework. Homework. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk for, we'll start with a small guided meditation, then a talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and we want to give plenty of time for questions. Not loud enough? Ah, I can lean forward like that. Is that better? Okay. So uh, we'll give plenty of time for questions so that people here have time as well as the people online. So. If I nagged Ajahn about the time, please forgive me, it's for your benefit. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see what happens first. Okay, do you want to try with that or this? Yes. Or? Can you hear me on this in the back? You can, excellent. Okay, so I think most of you know how to meditate. Can you hear or not? She's a bit hard of hearing. Do you want to use this, Ajahn? Can you? Oops. No, don't do it, don't do it. Just use this. Okay, yeah. yes. How's that? They're better. Okay, yes. So I think most of you know how to meditate, I understand. Is that correct? Okay. So the guided part of the meditation is please close your eyes. And that's the end of the guidance. <laughs> and now just be still. It's only for 15 minutes. Make sure you're comfortable. Bring the attention into this moment. I don't care where you came from or where you're going to afterwards. The only real time which has any essence or power is now. Now is where your future is being made. You learn more from the present than you ever do from the past. And anyway, this is a time just to be present. And when you are in the present moment, see if you can go that little bit deeper to be silent. Don't give things names, because the names carry the baggage of the past. 
plans and aspirations make baggage for the future. See if you can be light and free, just being here. Making being here more important than going somewhere. How do you feel right now? I don't even need to give it a name. Just know how it feels right now. When people have asked me what's my definition of mindfulness, I always say present moment awareness and silence. If you have done lots of meditation before, you may have a favorite meditation object. But even so, just whatever's happening right now is more than good enough. And number two is be kind to this moment. It's what I've called kindfulness. Be kind for us to whatever you're experiencing right now and just to see what happens. I will be quiet now. It's only another 10 minutes we come out of the meditation.
we're coming close to the end of this very short meditation. When you're ready, please open your eyes to complete the short meditation. <coughs> and again, one of the reasons why it's tradition almost to do a little meditation before giving the talk <coughs> is to prepare people's minds. <coughs> some, some of you have just come into this room, I'm not sure where you came from, but meeting each other, you've been busy. And it's good to be able to calm down at the beginning of a talk, and it makes the brain much more open to be able to listen to what's being said. It's always a very good introduction to a talk. People hear more, and they remember more, and they learn more once the mind has been calmed, first of all. But to go to the subject of the talk, which is about the right attitude towards jhanas, many of you know that that's one of the things I'm well known for, jhana freak. And please also know that this is based not just on personal experience, but also the knowledge of the suttas and the Vinaya, the teachings of the Buddha, they're the most accurate teachings which we have. And some of my friends uh, did a wonderful little booklet online. I wish they could have published it even for sale, called The Authenticity Project, which uh, has a series of amazing arguments on why the closest we can get to what the Buddha actually taught is looking at the Buddhist suttas and the Vinaya. Please excuse me, that excluded the Abhidhamma. Many people, I know sometimes I can get into trouble for this, but the arguments are that the Abhidhamma came after the time of the Buddha. You can question me on that afterwards. But nevertheless, the jhanas are really important. They're important because they are always the, the constant definition by the Buddha of the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path, the sama samadhi, the right samadhi. I won't translate that yet because for many years, many years in English, people accepted that that word samadhi meant concentration. And that was just something which really quite surprised me. And I've made it almost a mission in my monastic life to sort of argue against that. That English translation of samadhi as concentration just does not fit. Samadhi is not something you do. Samadhi is something which happens. The far better translation is stillness. And even uh, because I've been around a long time now, uh, that we used to have a couple of professors from Stanford would come and spend the range retreats uh, in our retreat center. And they came there because they weren't known. They could just disappear and do some meditation. When I discussed with her, who was obviously, she was a Chinese professor, and she was a very strong Buddhist, and she assured me that in the Chinese version of the Pali, that that was always samadhi meant uh, stillness, nothing else. And that changes a lot of our idea of how to meditate and the approach to meditation, why we meditate, and what happens when we meditate. And sometimes this might sound scholarly to you, but it's really important. I've been teaching this for almost 50 years now. This is my 49th completed year as a monk. Next year is a big 5-0. But nevertheless, one of the similes, which I've done so many times, which I'm sharing with you now, is a common simile 
but I used the glass of water in front of me just to describe it. Your mind can be looked upon like a body of water, like the water in this glass. And the goal of meditation, if you can call it a goal, is actually to bring this to a state of stillness. How do I get this water to be perfectly still? What mindfulness means is you're aware of it. That doesn't keep it still. Mindfulness is not enough. Concentration. Every time I try to keep this water still, I'm honestly trying to keep this water still by holding it. It always moves more. Concentration disturbs the mind. It's something you do. You exercise your will and it will always make more movement. And obvious, the way to keep this perfectly still, it should be obvious, you let it go, put it down, don't attach, don't grasp, leave it alone, let go. And now that water becomes far more still than I can ever hold it. This is one of the reasons why the once we can understand or accept that the meditation, samadhi, jhanas, means stillness, then we have the understanding on how that is experienced. We're more and more still. Now I go back to how Ajahn Chah used to teach me. He would often just you know, point to the, uh, the leaves on the bushes and the trees, which were moving outside. He said they only move because the wind is blowing. If that wind stopped, the leaves on the bushes and the trees would not stop moving yet. They would have to wait for a little while until the friction would soak up all their energy and they'd get more and more still until they would stop perfectly. Because he said that was their nature their natural state was a state of stillness. They only move because they're disturbed by something outside of themselves, like the wind. I really liked that simile because it meant that for a human being to be able to meditate, it's the natural state of your mind to be still. The only reason it's not still is because you keep disturbing it. One way is, is it still yet? Oh no. Come on, I haven't got all day. Come and get still. I'm going to hold you still. Stop interfering with the process. Your job is just to be mindful and to be kind. I say the mindfulness and the kindness. I'll introduce this now because it's such an important simile. Another simile which I remember from the first year from Ajahn Chah was that uh, he called his monastery Wat Ba Pong in the northeast of Thailand. He called it uh, a man an orchard of mango trees. And he said those mango trees were planted by the Buddha over 25 centuries earlier, which to me obviously made no sense. This particular time when I was listening to Ajahn Chah, I was very, very doubtful, always asking questions and challenging, because that's how I'd been brought up, as a theoretical physicist in the other place. <laughs> <laughs> and so it made no sense. If they were planted by the Buddha, they'd be dead a long time ago. But Ajahn Chah continued, they'd been planted by the Buddha, and now, 25 centuries later, there are thousands of juicy, ripe mangoes on that tree. But you can climb up that tree, you'll never reach those mangoes. You can throw a stick up, you won't get a mango to fall. You can get a ladder, it's not high enough to reach the mangoes. You can shake the tree, you can get a helicopter and try and get any of those mangoes. You will never be able to reach them. He said, there's only one way to get a mango 
on these trees which were planted by the Buddha. And that only way was to sit perfectly still underneath that mango tree, hold out your hand and a mango would fall. When I heard that in my first year as a monk, I thought it was absolutely crazy, ridiculous. I couldn't understand it at all. And I share that with you now because later on, when your meditation started to develop, I realized what a beautiful simile that was. You had to sit perfectly still, not moving at all, not creating any intentions or um, aspirations, not trying to get something, not trying to go anywhere, being perfectly still. And holding out your hand was having the kindness as well, the softness of the mind. If you put all your attention on just sitting still and holding your body or mind still, it's too much effort. The kindness was also crucial. And it's a strange thing, one of the reasons I tell that story to each one of you, is that when I first heard it, it made absolutely no sense, I argued with it, and then forgot it. Forgot it for years. And then, as I said, when the meditation really started to take off, it came back to me and I thought, what a beautiful simile that was. How accurate. Whenever we teach Dhamma, we teach it like putting seeds in a person's mind. And those seeds may be rejected, but you can't reject them. They get planted inside of you. And then after a while, after a while they germinate. Sometimes you think that's your own insights and wisdom. They've come from somewhere else, but it's incredibly powerful. It gives you that last little clue on how to keep the mind perfectly still. And that also brings me up to the attitude we have towards meditation, or actually to jhanas especially. I was fortunate, one of my first teachers was always emphasizing jhanas. And so I never grew up with like a vipassana tradition. When I first became a Buddhist, you know, jhana was important, that first teacher told me. And also later on, you know, I just checked in the suttas, in the books, as I've been telling a few people just even today, that because I had a good education, one of the subjects I had to learn was Pali. I hated it at the time. I thought, what use? Sorry, it was not Pali, it was Latin. What's the purpose of learning Latin in a country where hardly anyone speaks it? But I had to. And I always remember the little bit of graffiti carved into the desk at the school where I had to learn Latin. And it read, Latin is a language, as dead as dead could be. First it killed the Romans, now it's killing me. <laughs> Please excuse me, I have to tell a funny story every now and again. <clears throat> but it was helpful because it's close enough to Pali that once you learn Latin, it's easy to understand Pali. And when people started to argue, uh, discuss you know, quite wonderfully well about what did the Buddha actually teach? What is even the Eightfold Path? What is Samadhi, jhanas? Is it really necessary? It was very wonderful to be able to read those suttas and the Vinaya, because there's so much Dhamma in the Vinaya Pitaka, to read that in the original language. And it was like mind-blowing, opening up just some of the teachings of the Buddha, which were repeated again and again and again and again. You couldn't really reject them at all. And combining that with your own experience and experience of a very great teacher like an Ajahn Chah. And when <laughs> later I started becoming a teacher, I was kind of um, surprised that no one else was, not very few people were teaching real jhanas. 
I know that sometimes people know that I teach jhanas, but sometimes my standards are extremely high. I know that, I think you told me that some of you have studied with Lee Brassington. He wrote a book once and somebody showed me that if you think you have a jhana, don't go and see Ajahn Brahm. The reason was that he actually ranked the monks and nuns in order of how hard it was to get confirmation from each monk or nun. And I remember number two was Pa Oksido. He was very tough to get confirmation. But the top of the chart, number one, was this monk called Ajahn Brahm. I'm the toughest. If you come to me and say you've had this experience or that experience, a lot of time I will say no. Where other monks would say yes. And I do that out of honesty, understanding what I, I know about these jhanas. And first of all, the attitude towards them, how they happen. For many students, the first time you experience a jhana is a great surprise to you. It's unexpected. You never felt that such a thing could exist. And honestly, look, please excuse me, but I cannot tell about personal experience directly. That's against my Vinaya rules, and I keep them seriously. It's Pajitya number eight. A monk who tells lay people about his like supernormal attainments, even jhanas. That's an offense. I can't do that. So what I usually say, I know this monk. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, I'm pushing the envelope something, but I think it's important. I know this monk, the first time that he experienced the jhana. When he came out afterwards, one of the first things which he thought was, why hasn't anybody told me about this before? It was kind of kept secret. It was kind of not encouraged. It was only many years later that I discovered when I went to Vietnam and taught in Vietnam that it had been banned. Monks and nuns were not allowed to teach lay people jhanas. They'd all met together and said, this is too hard for lay people, too much problems, so don't even teach it. And of course, being a Westerner, that was just intolerable for me. If the Buddha taught it to lay people, lay people uh, experience these states in the time of the Buddha, why not now? So of course I started teaching it. But even then, I remember some, some places, they never encouraged jhana at all. I remember going to one monastery here in UK and one of the monks, as I was going in, grabbed me by the shoulder, pulled me aside and said, Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahm. He looked around, he was going to tell me something secret, like he was going to pass me a, a, a naughty magazine like the Playboy or something. We don't do that though in monasteries. He said, when no one was listening, Thank you for teaching jhana. Even the monk had to keep his uh, admiration of jhana teaching secret. It was controversial. And one of the things which I am very happy about now, not just being able to give full ordination to women, bhikkhunis, and it's not just giving full ordination, it's creating places where they can practice. If you give ordination, it's like a responsibility. A responsibility not just to give them the brown robes and the status of a bhikkhuni, but finding a place where they can practice. It's like when you give birth to a child. You just don't give birth to a child and think that's the job all over. You're going to look after them until they're independent. So that's one thing with the bhikkhuni sangha, but the other thing which I'll put down in 
you know, to some things which I have feel very happy about is actually bringing to people's attention the importance of jhana, the availability of jhana, that you can do it, every one of you, and what that jhana actually is. So how it works, first of all, it becomes unexpected. You get all the causes in the right place. One of those causes is your sila, your virtue. That's why I know that Venerable Chanda was asking me, please, please, please say this. And it's sila paribhavato samadhi mahaparohoti mahani samso. I chant that every time I do an ordination ceremony for male and female. What it means is that when uh, you have strong sila, strong virtue, keeping precepts, a really good, virtuous, kind person, then your samadhi, your meditation, is of great power and benefit. So said the Buddha. If you can keep good precepts, if you can be kind, generous, not a very virtuous person, that assists your meditation enormously. And even further, if you can keep some sense restraint. That sense restraint means it's not just keeping rules, it's why are you keeping those rules? You're letting go of much of your attachments in this world. Instead of seeking pleasure in the world of the five senses, you're finding much better pleasure elsewhere. And that's why I said that the first time that that man I knew who got into a deep meditation, the first response afterwards was, why hasn't anyone told me about this before? This was a time that young man was a student at the other place. <laughs> he was having a full uh, sexual life with his girlfriend. And I remember he, that he'd left his girlfriend in Gloucester, not that far from here, and just went to do a retreat at the other place. And so it was weird. Only a couple of weeks after being with, your, with his girlfriend and then getting into a deep meditation. More pleasure, a more pure part of, pure, pure pleasure, lasting much longer. It's weird. So I want to tell you that that's one of the signs of a jhana. Incredible pleasure. And if any of you ever think that such a pleasure is not allowed for a monk, or a nun, or a lay Buddhist. That is totally not according to the advice of a Buddha. The Buddha particularly stated, and this is in the Pasadika Sutta, if anybody asks you, do monks and nuns have pleasure? You should ask, what type of pleasure? If you say it's a pleasure of the five senses, no. That's what we restrain. If it's pleasures of the mind, yes, you should answer. But what would happen if monks and nuns and lay men, lay women, if you indulge in the pleasures of the mind? Is that good outcomes? And how the Buddha responded was, any one of you, monk, nun, lay man, lay woman, LGBT, LGBQ, oh, TIA plus, <laughs> anyone, old or young, from whatever uh, nation you came from, anyone, even people from Oxford, <laughs> <laughs> all of you, if you get attached to those pleasures of the mind, only four outcomes are possible. Only one of these four things has to happen. And those four outcomes are stream winning, once and non stream winning, once returning, non-returning, or full enlightenment. 
That's what we're supposed to be Buddhists for, to be able to become enlightened. And that's what the Buddha said specifically. Any of you indulge, do lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of jhana, enjoy it. You're going to become enlightened. You're going to arrive, baby, arrive. <laughs> I'm going to try to make these talks interesting, so please excuse my uh, going off into modern language. But anyhow, one of the other things I can, I keep on reminding myself, because you always remember your teacher, was very impressive, this was Ajahn Chah. He'd always tell us, again and again and again and again, that we meditate to let go of things, not to attain things. Meditate to let go, not to attain. And that's one of the reasons why, even from the early time, you never look upon these jhanas as attainments, as degrees of letting go. How much can you let go? And that is kind of the heart of this Buddhist practice. So any time I see people after a retreat and one said, how did you go, how did you go? Did you get first jhana? And they said, oh yeah, I got first jhana. That's nothing, I got second jhana. Second jhana, I got that last time. I got third jhana now. I'm aiming for fourth jhana. It's just a lot of bozos. <laughs> Do you understand the word bozo? Okay, good. <laughs> In other words, that's not how you meditate. That tells me that I've got a clue what these jhanas are. Instead, I like after a retreat or after people have done some meditation, if they came up, up to me and say that they've had a very wonderful meditation, I don't ask what they experienced. I ask what had disappeared, what had gone, what was lost. It's a beautiful way of actually assessing where a person's at how much you've disappeared. These are different states of disappearing. A little disappeared, more disappeared, completely disappeared. Your sense of self, who you think you are. Once you understand these Buddha's teachings, the Buddha kept on saying you don't own anything anyway. Who the heck do you think you are? The whole job of meditation is using all that wisdom, all the virtue you trained with, all of the mindfulness and the kindness, to be able to let go even more and to see things disappear. Which is fascinating. Why is disappearance so blissful? It's because much of the stuff which we live with all the time is a big heavy burden. You may read that in the suttas, you may teach that to others, that this body is a, is a heavy weight. These five senses will never satisfy you. These five senses are again another burden. Can you let go of those five senses? If so, how? Here in UK, this is where I obviously grew up, and in the 60s and 70s, I would go to any place where they taught meditation. I, it was Buddhism in UK was too, uh, basically not there in the 60s and 70s. I still remember this Zen monk who came to the Thai temple in London. And I saw him the first time he came there to give a talk. And after two or three months, uh, traveling around England. He came back to give his last talk before he flew back to Japan. And somebody asked him this question. What do you think of Buddhism in UK? That may be in around 1970. His answer, when he first came, he always needed a translator. And his last talk, two or three months later, which I attended, he'd learned a little bit of English, enough to give this wonderful answer. Buddhism in England. 
books, books, books. Too many, too many, too many. Dustbin, dustbin, dustbin. <laughs> Please excuse me, because many of the monks in the Oxford Buddhist Vihara, you're here because of books. But I kind of, <laughs> kind of like that answer, even though I was a book person at the time. So, getting the essence of Buddhism, learning how to let things go, let things be, disappear. That's much more what Buddhism is, what the path of meditation is. But why let go? What's the purpose of it? The purpose of it is explained in the simile of the tadpole and the water. You know, there was once a little tadpole who was born in a lake in Wolfson College in Oxford. She was a, such a bright little tadpole that she finished her schooling and then high school. She was so smart that she decided to do a degree in hydrology. So she studied water and eventually got a PhD in water. And because the monks would visit often, the little tadpole knew all about the Buddhist idea of water, even the Abhidhamma idea of water. She became an expert on water. But do you think that little tadpole could understand anything about the real nature of water? She knew all the theory, all the words, but how can a tadpole born in the water, lived all its life in the water, know what water really is? No more than a fish can know what water is. But the difference between the tadpole and the fish was one day that little tadpole grows legs and arms. It changes into a frog. And one day that little frog, she doesn't know what she's doing, but she jumps. And she finds herself on dry land. Imagine what that must feel like to that frog. Something which was always there, all of its life, is now missing, it's gone. That's how I understand anicca. Not the things come and go, come and go, but something which you've always had there for such a long time, you take for granted, you can't understand what it really is. Disappears for long periods of time. And that's weird. Something which has always been there disappears. But anyway, going back to those days in the 70s, I managed to find a retreat being held in a Zen monastery in the, in the north, in Northumberland. That was in Throstle Hall. I don't know if, if any of you have been there or know it. But in those days, I didn't know too much about Zen meditation, but I'd done a lot of Theravada meditation. I knew about mindfulness and silence in my mind. So we were taken to this hall, whitewashed walls. We had to sit facing that wall with our eyes open. That was all the instructions I was given. But in those days, I was adventurous enough to try anything. So with the eyes open, we were watching that wall about 45 minutes, and then a weird thing happened. The wall vanished. The wall totally disappeared. It was there one moment, it was a solid wall, and then it wasn't there anymore. It had disappeared and vanished. At the time, I thought that was really cool. Many of my friends were taking drugs, I never took drugs. That's a very cool experience, sitting watching a wall and it just suddenly vanishes. But of course, because of training in science, why? It became obvious after a little bit of uh, examination, insight, that what was happening when things become still, that wall wasn't moving, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't trying to name anything, I was in this moment, I was silent as I was watching this and the brain basically turned off. 
sense of sight. Same as if there is a fan in this room or an air con. After a while, you won't be able to hear it. That constant impression on any one of the senses, if it doesn't change, the brain stops observing it. That's what it was. And it's so similar, but it was just more profound than when you close your eyes at the beginning of meditation. If you notice it, you can see the inside of your eyelids. And after a few minutes, that experience vanishes. This was actually a wall, not the inside of my eyelids. But that gave me these wonderful insights into what happens when things are still. They vanish. And that's exactly what we were doing to get into these jhanas. You keep your five senses perfectly still. You sit down, comfortable position, you can even lie down. Your posture is not important, only as far as it's comfortable so your body doesn't disturb you. In a reasonably silent place, it doesn't have to be totally quiet, so you can turn off from sound, closing your eyes so the sight doesn't disturb you, and the bodily, um, physical feeling pretty comfortable, and also smell and taste kind of disappear. They're easy senses to turn off. The two hard senses to turn off, physical feelings and also sound. Because the physical feelings are hard to turn off, that's one of the reasons why we focus on something like the breath. I call the breath a stepping stone. It's almost, it is part of the body to start off with, but if you practice even as the Buddha taught, that physical feeling of the breath disappears and the mental experience of the breath takes over. It's the Chitta Sankara, where you're experiencing the breath with this incredible piti sukha, with joy, with bliss. I don't know what name you wish to call it, but it's extremely pleasurable. Because it's extremely pleasurable, you don't need to do any will. It's just wonderful to look at or to experience. You're turning from the body to the mind. And for the next tetrad, the third tetrad, that's where you experience the jitta. Usually, most people experience... Okay. Most people experience that as a beautiful light, what we call the nimittas. And please, I know that I had an argument with one monk who said the Buddha never taught that. Of course he taught that. That's in the Upakalesa Sutta 108. And that's just what happens. I want to wait, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's just what happens when you're meditating. You see some beautiful lights in the mind, which are also incredibly blissful. It's one of the reasons why this path into meditation, deep meditation, gets bliss upon bliss, upon bliss, oh. And that's an important quality, because that's one of the reasons just why you can sustain this for long periods of time. It's the best bliss you've ever had. Not just that, but as it gets more and more, it's a mental experience of bliss, not physical, the body just disappears. And this is one of the reasons why you can know what a jhana is. In a jhana you can't hear any sound. If someone calls you, shell, 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 you will be able to hear them. They think you've gone dead. Not dead as well. <laughs> you can't feel anything in your body. A good example of this, because I'm supposed to finish in one minute's time. <laughs> a good example of this is this Indonesian monk. His name was Sudama. I don't usually tell about monks who've attained these deep meditation states, but this monk is now dead. But I met him. He described his experience. 
he was many years ago, that he was just a lay person. He wanted to become like a rishi, like a, a person who just goes into the jungles and disappears. And he found a nice place to meditate in the jungles of Java. This was many, many years ago when there were still jungles in Java. I go there very often. And he found a nice place to meditate. And his experience, he said, he was meditating, getting very peaceful. And then this, this like angel, that's how he described this beautiful light just came into his mind. And I like the way he said it first of all, because his English wasn't that good. He said he married the angel. <laughs> Basically united with it. And had a wonderful experience for he didn't know how long. But when he came out of that meditation, he noticed that part of the jungle where he was sitting had changed. It had changed, it looked totally different than when he started his meditation. He checked with the villagers afterwards and they said that that had been a fl an area where there had been a flash flood. He'd been sitting there for many days, totally immersed in a couple of meters of water. When you have deep meditation, you become kind of invulnerable. There's another, and that was this guy Sudam, he eventually became a monk in Wat Bawan, and then he passed away. But be careful. This was told to me by one of his students, who was, uh, she was a princess, a mom, sorry, a mom Luang, for anyone who knows Thai. She used to uh, try and learn meditation from him. But one day, she, in a meditation class in Wat Bawan, she was sitting there and she felt that there was something going on, something strange. She opened her eyes and she, she swears to me, this is actually true, she actually saw it. There was rays of light coming out of his two eyes into one of the other meditators, like laser lights. Please, if any of you monks ever can do things like that. Restrain yourself, don't do that. This girl got so freaked out, she got up and left and never went back. And I know he's just a good friend. She did her uh, art course at uh, Chelsea Art College. You know, she, she came over here years and years and years ago and did uh, uh, artwork. She did batik work over in Bangkok. Uh, at Chelsea Art College. See, that's where she learnt it. But she was this lady who saw a monk with laser eyes. This is what happens. This is real. I don't mind telling you this. I tell you this because it, you are perfectly safe within these deep meditations. And I say that because it's so powerful, some of you may feel afraid. You lose all of your defenses, which is your five senses. You can't hear anything. You can't feel anything. Someone may try and chop your head off. <laughs> they can't do it. There's a couple of people here from Sri Lanka. I've been teaching there for many, many years now. There's one group who told me, and they actually, I've got the video over in Perth. Is one of you know, their disciples that they uh, can get into these jhanas pretty easy. And he was a doctor. So under a video, he actually tried to do an incision on this disciple's arm with a scalpel. You know, they don't wear that much clothes over in Sri Lanka, it's a very hot country. He lifted up his, jack his sleeve and he, not anesthetized, but what is it, uh, uh, put alcohol on the, the arm to uh, disinfect it, got out a scalpel and tried to cut. He put more and more force on the scalpel because the scalpel wouldn't penetrate the skin. And he filmed it. And then when uh, the experiment was finished, the disciple came out and the doctor told him what he'd just done. They were good friends, they trusted each other. And so the doctor asked, 
if I try this again, do you give me permission? He said, yes. So he went back into deep meditation. It was deep meditation, because he did the same procedure again, you now disinfect uh, the arm, and this time the scalpel went through the skin, left a cut. That usually would hurt. This guy in deep meditation didn't feel a thing. And that allowed the doctor to sew up the wound. Again, put some ointment on it and a bandage. And when he came out, he didn't know what had happened. It was all filmed, just as an experiment to show what happens when you are in deep meditation. The only reason I say that is please don't be afraid if these deep meditations start to happen. Because the result of them is again, you understand what it's like when the five senses are gone and they disappear. Not only do you understand what happens that they're gone, it's just the five senses, first of all. There's more things disappear in deeper meditations. So if you want to know what the five senses are, and what happens when they're gone, and what happens when other things start to disappear, like your will. Do you understand what your will is? Do you think you own your will? Is that an important part of you? Why do you always guard your will? To have free elections, to have the freedom of choice. Does such a thing exist? These are tough questions. And the Buddha says there's no one in there. So how can you have a will? Who has a will? Who controls you? I'm not going to answer that now, because I'm already over time. But nevertheless, even in the second jhana, your will has totally vanished. You can't decide to do anything. Weird, but true. Only when you come out afterwards, you realize what has happened. So these are just some examples of what happens in these deep meditations. Perfectly safe, but wonderful experiences and great insights afterwards. As even I heard from one of the monks in the Jogja order in South Korea, that the best way to see the full moon at night is to go up into a mountain, find a lake which is perfectly still. There's no ripples on the surface of that lake. Then the reflection of the moon and the stars in the sky, moon and the stars in the sky, the reflection is not distorted. The only way to get those deep insights, not to see what you want to see, but see what is real, is actually to get this mind perfectly still. Just like that lake, and reflection on that lake of the moon and the stars in the heavens above is not distorted. Okay, please excuse me, I really get into this. I really enjoy, enjoy talking about this. It's one of my passions, like supporting bhikkhunis. So anyway, now's a good opportunity to open it up for questions and answers. So I might start with one from the Zoom then, because uh, just to include you all, since you're not here. Um, so I'll, I'll start with this. There's no a few one, here already. No one's here. No one's here. <laughs> but there's still questions. Mm. Questions without a questioner. Good. All right. Question. <laughs> Ajahn, last year you told me to stop trying to control things. I've been able to see my mind trying to control when the nimitta comes in. That's the light in the mind. However, can't get the controlling mind to stop, even though I know it's not helpful. Ah, can you offer me some guidance? Okay. This is again a nice metaphor which was taught to me personally by Ajahn Chah. And he said that when you were one of these monks who were wandering through the jungles, in Thailand we called it Tudong, in Sri Lanka, Charika, when you were wandering through these jungles, 
You'd always f try and find a place by a river or a lake in mid-afternoon because you need to wash, and maybe wash a robe and filter some water for drinking. And after you've done all those little chores, then you set up your mosquito net umbrella, maybe about 10 meters from the edge of the lake. And then you would sit there all night or sleep if you were tired. And Ajahn Chah told me that sometimes he would sit there in the evening when the sun went down. And of course, that lake was not just used by him. There was a drinking hole, washing hole for all the animals in the forest. So he would sit there perfectly still and watch all these animals come out from the bushes. And he said he'd have to sit still Otherwise, the animals which came out, the bears, the tigers, elephants, they would notice he was there. Just a small move, like just touching his nose, they would see that. Because the animals were more scared of humans than humans are ever scared of the animals. Okay, please come in. So this is one of the reasons why that... Okay. One of these things there. Very good. This one. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you, it's okay. Okay. Very good. No. Thank you for looking after us. So anyway, he had Ajahn Chah had to sit perfectly still to see these beautiful animals come out. And even like tigers, they would look around. Their eyes were not that good, so they would sniff and they would listen. If he made any movement, they would know that someone was watching and they'd run away, even though they were very thirsty. And once the head animal came out, all the, the family would come out. Remember, this is such a long time ago. These days we have Nature Channel. So where you can actually see all the, is it Nature Channel, National Geographic? I don't know, I don't watch TV, but you can see all these things on TV and it's very fun to watch. But when he was still, they'd all come out to play by the still forest pool. And then, once they'd played by the, the lake, then these very strange and shy animals would come out to play. These were like nimitas, a metaphor for them. If he even moved slightly, try to control them, they'd know that someone was watching and they'd run away. So the advice to the person who wants to control those limiters, you try and control them, they'll know you're watching, they'll run away. They won't come up again for days sometimes or years. Your job is to sit perfectly still. Don't react, don't move. And it's one of the hardest things sometimes, you see these incredibly beautiful lights in the mind, and not to say, wow, look at that. It ruins them. And then Ajahn Chah would continue by saying, sometimes he sits, sat so still, that once those strange and weird animals came out, then some animals came out he never believed existed. No one had ever taught to him about them. Those were the jhanas. Come out last of all. You have to sit there, not interfering at all. Sit like a statue to know, but don't move. That's the training. Uh, anything from here? Yeah, okay, yes. Just wait for the mic, please. <laughs> Hi. Um, I find that the more that I practice, the less I suffer. I feel like I can't fall I just want to play around in the water instead of growing legs. And um, I find that my spiritual urgency isn't really there as much. It, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It's not your choice. Those legs 
and arms will grow. He will jump out and you think, that's not me, but it just happens. This is a wonderful thing about this path. You aren't in control. Whether you like it or not, you'll get limiters. I guarantee that. Each one of you will experience this beautiful light when you die. Of course you've heard that before. When you die, you go towards the light. What the heck do you think that light is? Your five senses are being turned off. It's called death. And now you've heard me say what that light is. Don't be afraid of it. Just go for it. Go right into it. And those people who've had out-of-the-body experiences. One of the people I like talking about is this Hindu. Uh, she had this experience in Hong Kong, Anita Murajani. She was a Christian. So, sorry? She was a Hindu or a Christian? I think she was a Christian. Because oh. actually when she um, had this out-of-body experience, she had these terrible cancers. And doctors were, tr doctors were trying to keep her alive. And she just floated out of her body, went towards this light, merged in the light, blissed out. She called it a union with God. That's why I think she was a Christian. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, when she came out, she had this insight. Always happens after these deep experiences. And the insight was the cause of her cancer was that she was trying to please other people too much. And after that, when she came out, when she actually, the first words she spoke to the doctors who were surprised that she'd survived, she said, my cancer has been cured. They said, I just, she's still a bit crazy from the operation. But it was. And the weird thing about that, her GP was a fellow called Brian Walker, who was working in Hong Kong at that time. And that GP, it changed his whole life, and he decided to migrate to Australia, to this little town called Serpentine. He is my doctor, my GP. Did you go and see him? I have done, yeah. Yeah. And so that cool. is very cool. It changed his whole life when those things happen. I don't know why he chose to go to Perth, but that's where he is. <coughs> He's too busy to take new people. He only treats two diseases now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. But anyway, here's my GP on the, the list. I, I never need to go and see him because there's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> How would you know if you never see him? I never see him because I know my body. I'm mindful of my body. I can feel. That's what mindfulness is. <laughs> you should be able to know your body more than your doctor does. The doctor just depends on what you say. Fair enough. Okay, good. All right. Can we take another one from the Zoom? Yeah, sure. Oh, did I answer your question? Okay. Okay, very good. In the suttas, the Buddha is described as moving through the eight jhanas and then gaining the knowledge of suffering, its origin, ending, and freedom. But it doesn't clearly lay out his understanding of suffering in the same detail as his discussion of the jhanas. Can you help me understand? Is this the stillness of waiting for the mango after eighth jhana? Or should Vipassana and the three marks be the focus? First of all, and he's explained very well that once you experience the jhana, it becomes automatic. You can't resist. You've had these amazing experiences. And I can't see how anybody, anybody would not look back upon that and say, wow, what was that? All you really need is to have somebody who has some understanding of these processes, some understanding of the sense of non-self. Once you have that wisdom added to those experiences of jhana, as the Buddha said, you are in the presence of Nibbāna. Nati jhanang apanyasa panya nati yajayato yam hi jhanang cha sawe nibbāna santike. There's no jhana without wisdom. There's no wisdom without jhana. In the one who has jhana and wisdom, they are in the presence of Nibbāna. She's so close. 
So insight will happen automatically. You don't do anything. You can't even do jhanas. You let go. Now in Sri Lanka some years ago, that I was teaching some monks, just monks. And they asked me, said, look, you can't just hide behind vineyard walls now because, you know, that you're just monks here. So Ajahn Brahm, you talk about jhanas, can you do them? Tell us. There's no excuses. So my answer was, sometimes I play around, you know, I'm very playful. I looked down and said, Ajahn Brahm cannot enter jhana. Ajahn, are you shocked? <laughs> Please wait. Ajahn Brahm has to disappear first and then jhanas happen. I had to say that because they were videoing it as well. They'd show all sorts of people. I have to keep my rules, but also it was a beautiful way of describing these jhanas. You disappear. You're not there. Your sense of self has gone. Your body has gone. Your will disappears. Your understanding of who you are is just not there. You're perfectly alert, perfectly awake. You know the, the strongest, purest mindfulness? is a description of fourth jhana. But, okay, okay, can't keep going on, okay, fair enough. Yes. Go on. I was just going to say, if you look at the suttas, the way the Buddha described it, the Buddha never called the four immaterial states as jhanas. These are just special cases of the fourth jhana. Only called four jhanas, just four, <coughs> not five, not six. Those last four are immaterial states, all special cases of the four jhana, fourth jhana. All right, coming back to the Zoom. Uh, wanting to be, com does it come from some sort of conditioning or is it intrinsic to the mind? Conditioning, it's not intrinsic. Because there comes a time, especially in these deep meditations or in enlightenment, wanting to be disappears. You don't want to be, you don't not want to be. That f totally vanishes. Wanting to be is because you assume there is a self. That's easy. Do you want to be anything? Do you want to ask a question? <laughs> okay, go on. You go on, yes. Um, yeah, good. So I'm wondering, uh, is there a difference between the type of problems that students who grew up in like, traditional Thai uh, monasteries will run into versus the students that you see in the Western? Uh, you can't generalize like that. Some very wise people who have been immersed in Buddhism all their life, but sometimes they find there's a problem with that and they sort of rebel, and they're open. But some people who are Westerners, who you know, just want to think for themselves or be themselves, and they find a problem with that as well. So it doesn't really matter. I can't find any difference there at all. These days people are, are challenging traditions because traditions don't work. Just for the people on, <coughs> sorry, for the people on Zoom, the question was whether there's a difference between people coming from the so-called Western countries and from Asian countries, whether it's easier for one race, I guess, to get into jhana than another. So that was the question. Yeah. One thing I will say to be controversial: in all the years I've been teaching these jhanas, women tend to get jhanas more easily. That'll do. That'll do. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons I suspect is because these jhanas are very strong, high emotional states. 
and men are very scared of them. You, you can't control them, you lose control. You tend to disappear. For females, it's much more giving, letting go. Somehow or other, just you're conditioned to do that more easily. But don't worry, because nah, when it gets to the it. no, when it gets to the insight and understanding what these things mean, the guys catch up. <laughs> don't believe it. <laughs> okay, another question from Zoom. Uh, a question asked probably many times already, but it's a deep one. Anyway, do you think there's something such as free will, or is it all about karma, our conditioning? Where do our thoughts come from? I meditate regularly. I'm more and more surprised by the fact that thoughts come up all by themselves. The only thing I feel I can do is to sometimes let it go and stop thinking for a little while, but no chance to control thoughts or actions. They come all by themselves. First of all, there is no such thing as free will. And you can find that out for yourself. I'm not going to argue it philosophically. I'm going to I'll test you, to ask you to get into a second jhana, a real second jhana. In the second jhana, you can't say anything. You can't say, oh, is this the first jhana? Is this the second jhana? Now I'll go to a third jhana. You can't say anything. All those thoughts are just not there. And all the will is totally vanished. Only when the will is vanished can you understand what the will actually is. And what you find out it is, it is totally conditioned. That's why I don't mind teaching you all of this, even if you don't agree with it or don't accept it. I'm sorry, but it's too late for you. You have been conditioned, brainwashed. You shouldn't have come in here if you didn't want to be enlightened. <laughs> Where does it come from? That's interesting. Even just this visit I was visiting my relations. And these are people I haven't seen for over 50 years, like first cousins. And when I gave a talk over in Sheffield, no, Manchester, I was talking about the opening of the door for your heart simile. And my cousin was amazed. That's what my mum used to say. He said, my mum taught your dad, and my dad gave that suggestion to me. I can't remember that, but it's, I'm pretty confident that's true. My opening the door for my, your heart simile came from my uh, auntie years and years and years and years ago. It's weird. But some of the things I say will come up in your meditation at the very end. You may think it's your insight, it ain't. Even Four Noble Truths, for the Buddha. Did that come from the Buddha? No. It came from Buddha Kasapa, because Buddha Sakyamuni, he was a, a monk under Buddha Kasapa earlier. That's where he got his seeds of wisdom from. That's where you get your seeds of wisdom from. From this person, that person, that person, that person. It goes all down the line. Another from the floor? Yeah. You and then you. Yes, you. Yeah. yeah. Go on. Oh, yes, the mic's coming. We need to summarize it for the Zoomies. Okay. We need to summarize the question. Okay, yeah. Someone sits down, say, early morning before they go to work and happens to fall into Java, let's say, and then they think, oh, I'm going to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going. No, good, yeah. You're asking that if somebody gets into a jhana early in the morning before they go to work, is there danger they won't go to work? Yes. You won't mind. You have a wonderful time. <laughs> but what we usually do, if you have to have an important appointment, say, what you do is you make a resolution, you program your mindfulness. When you sit down and say, I will come out of meditation by, say, 8 o'clock. I will come out by 8 o'clock. I will come out by 8 o'clock. Repeat it in your own language three times. It's amazing, just, that always works. There was this Vietnamese monk, Vietnamese Theravada, over in Sydney, taught a retreat, nine-day retreat. He was a really good meditator. And 
first half an hour of the retreat and they did meditation together. He was supposed to come out at eight o'clock to give the first talk. At eight o'clock he hadn't come out of meditation, he was still sitting there. So everybody went to bed. He sat there all night. When they come up in the morning for the morning uh, chanting, he was still sitting there. He never gave a talk at all. He just sat there for eight days, not moving at all. No in the suttas says he could only do that for seven days. He did it for eight. And then afterwards, when he came out, he apologized. He said, look, I should have made that resolution. I've got to come out by eight o'clock to give a talk, but I forgot. And all the people there, they said, no, that was amazing. We actually saw that. It was real. You sat there without moving, without eating, drinking or anything. Or going to the toilet for seven, eight days. That was inspiring. It kind of taught me one thing. It's okay to go on retreats and it inspires people. There's many ways of teaching. Teaching by words is one way. Teaching by example is even more powerful. Okay? Yeah, I got my permission for Yeah, of course. In <laughs> even, even Oxford. Even in Oxford. Doesn't matter. Yeah, absolutely. Was that from the floor? Yes. So next question from Zoom. Uh, when an emitter comes, do you keep watching it or keep concentrating on the breath? You do nothing. Let the mind choose. A lot of times people still want to control. Should I do this and should I do that? You do nothing. Imagine yourself like in, a, in an aircraft. In an aircraft. Buddha air. It's already taken off. Can you ever ask the captain or one of the flight attendants, hurry up, I've got to get to, to London soon. Of course you can't. You sit back there and just watch and enjoy. The, not the in-flight service, the insight service. <laughs> and it only happens when you don't say anything, you don't do anything. So if an inhibitor comes up, don't do anything. See what happens. What's in front of you right now? That's all you need to do. Don't choose where you're going to go next. Just be where you are. Super. Uh, this lady? Thank you. Boss. Oh. Boss. That's nice. <laughs> so, um, That's good. Uh, when you are dying and experiencing the mantas and blissfulness, is that considered a jhana state or is it something else? It's not a jhana state yet, but you can turn it into one if you want. Experiencing the nimittas, that's just the, the experiencing the mind, it's blissful. But you have to really get into it and it stays there. And that can be an, a jhana experience. It's a weird thing, but there is even in the suttas like a, a shortcut Anyone who's a stream winner, who gets into a jhana when they die, they become what's called a jhana anagami, a jhana non-returner. You haven't sort of got that state in this life, you're just a stream winner, but then you get jhanas. Then you bliss out for a few eons, when you come out of that state, you're nibbana. So nothing from Zoom at the moment. Uh, any more from the floor? Come on, you're only just getting going. Any for the monks? <laughs> for me? Yeah. The monks can ask oh, questions. Okay, yeah. For the monk. Yeah. Uh, Five minutes. Uh, I was wondering how important uh, question is. Questions can be very important, but sometimes there comes a time. Uh, the story behind this was there was one of the Thai monks I was really inspired by. His name was Ajahn Tate. He had cancer when I first arrived in Thailand. I looked after by the, His Majesty the King of Thailand at the time. He, doctors gave up on him. So he said, if I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die in my monastery on the Mekong River. 25 years later he died. <laughs> no one knows why, but he was a really good meditator. 
And so I had some other questions to ask him. And so I made the journey to his monastery. In those days, even I as a monk had to put my name down on a list and wait to have an appointment to ask questions of him. And when I asked, went into the room, I'd been waiting for days and these were really important questions. And as soon as I went into his room, I went so quiet and so peaceful, all those questions vanished. What do you need questions for when you have the answer right in front of you? The stillness, the peace, the joy. A lot of times questions, we feel we need to ask the questions to get an answer, but how often have you noticed the answer doesn't satisfy you? Just leave some more questions. But sometimes you ask a question or you intend to ask a question and everything becomes so peaceful so still, you find that questions are actually like waves on the surface of the lake. If you will just wait for a while, those waves all become still. You don't need any questions anymore. Okay, bye. <laughs> In the back, yes. Practice in the Mahati tradition, and if I wanted to start a journey practice, does that mean that I would have to kind of do a different sort of meditation, um, or can you still continue your other practices? Um, paraphrase. Sorry. Would you paraphrase for the Zoom? Sure. Um, the question was from someone who practices in the Mahasi tradition. Oh, yeah. I hope the Zoom folks can hear me. Is that yeah? Good. Um, and they're wondering that if they want to start a jhana practice, would they need to actually change from the Mahasi practice they're already doing, or could that practice be a way in, in and of itself? Is that correct? Yeah. I know many times people doing a Mahasi practice, they get nimittas anyway. And the trouble is that sometimes you tell the teacher there, saw this beautiful light in the mind, really blissed out, and they say, don't do it again. So the nice thing to do is, if this makes sense to you, you can check it out for yourself. You can carry on doing the Mahasi tradition. When you get a nice dimeter, shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> Actually, the, the teacher should know that this is part of the Dhamma, part of Buddhism, and it's good. You know, become a brilliant mind. So please do those nimittas, those jhanas. Only when the, you've experienced jhana, this is Nalakapana Sutta, only when you've experienced jhana do the five hindrances disappear for a long time, together with tandi and arati. This arati is discontent, then tandi is a weariness. You get energized by these jhanas and you can't be upset. That's one of the reasons why, if any of you come up to me and say, oh, I think I've got a jhana, I'd look at you and say, no, no, Mahasi people can't get jhanas. Or I'd say even better than that, uh, are you Sri Lankan or Indian? Indian? I'd say Indian women can't get jhanas. They just can't do it. Maybe in your next life, get reborn as a man. I try to offend you, <laughs> whatever I can to stir you up. And if you get upset, you realize that wasn't a jhana. After a jhana, you cannot get upset. So please remember, get, don't quote me on that. Ajahn Brahm is a racist, intolerant. <laughs> we only do that to try and get a response from you to test out whether it was a jhana or not. Lots from the Zoom group now. Go, so okay. So, there weren't any. so Go they thought they'd better hurry up and ask some questions. Yeah. Really good questions. Um, where shall we begin? Can someone go into jhanas when taking antidepressants? Yes. All right. Great. Anything more needed? No. No. Super. Is it possible for a group to be told to go briefly into jhanas during a practice, and would that be r real jhanas? No. All right, they're really easy. Now look, if you're in a jhana, it's a long time. 
why on earth would anybody just want to go in there for, for a brief time? And you can't tell a group to do this. You just make the situation uh, appropriate or open for them. Some will go in, some won't. You can't tell anybody. You can't even tell yourself to get into jhanas. All right, we'll do a few more because they're quite Go short, on. hopefully. <laughs> do you have to be at peace with yourself to do meditation and reach jhanas? No, you have to disappear. You're not at peace with yourself, you're not there anymore. But don't you have to be at peace first? Oh, first, yes. Actually, no. How far do you have to be at peace with yourself? Not at all. Because sometimes, I've seen that some people get into these jhanas out of frustration. They just... Well, there's one monk I know, very well. <laughs> he developed scrub typhus in northeast Thailand. It's like typhoid, no one knew what it was. So he was in the hospital, and this was a third world country at the time, in a backwater, in a monk's ward, and it was really rough. And that monk told me there's never been so, so little energy in his life. It's just hard to go to the toilet, you had to go to, from one bed to the other bed, get your energy back up again, then go to the next bed. You only went to the toilet once a day because you, know, you didn't have enough energy to go twice. There's no bedpans or anything. So anyway, that one day, this monk told me he got very, very depressed and very fed up. Nothing was working, no energy, no sim and no one knew what was going on. And so I decided to meditate and got into jhana even when you were really sick and tired. That's basically out of frustration. I w that monk wasn't at peace with himself at the time. Yeah, but what about being psychologically at peace with yourself? Because I think you always had like a lot of uh, sense of belonging and unconditional love. And no. Things like this. No. You know it now. No. <laughs> no, this can be done by anybody. Okay, from the floor maybe. Anything more? Uh, yeah. I am from a couple of years ago. There was a case that um, was worldwide known. There were about uh, 12 boys, I think, 12 young boys below the age of 15, took off tapes. They were stuck with their assistant coach deep in the caves, and they were not found after, until after 10 years. Yeah. So the assistant coach has, um, I think they were in the bottles of Thai. Yes. And he said that he has been to a monastery before, he practiced meditation, and that helped the boys survive. The 10 days without food, water, or light in the cave. I don't know, I know you weren't there, but could you let us know what might have happened there to keep the boys alive? Also? Okay, it's again the meditation. It. Yes, it's just those boys who were uh, caught uh, in that cave in Thailand and they couldn't get out because they were trapped by the water and there was no light, no food, no water. How could they survive? And I think their coach, who's a football team, I think, their coach had done some meditation before. That was just ordinary positive attitude. They still had enough air there to breathe, but they didn't breathe much because they were meditating. And also just that positive attitude just kept them just waiting. That's not jhana. That's just very, very good meditation and keeping the positive energy going. Only 10 days. Okay, one more from Zoom. Is there such a thing as momentary samadhi where a person can enter and come out of a state of samadhi? Thank no. You <laughs> when you look at samadhi, if it's called concentration, that's possible. But if it's stillness, Momentary stillness, what does that mean? This is momentary still. In the suttas, that momentary samadhi, kanika samadhi, does not exist in the teachings of the Buddha. It comes from commentaries. One of the nice things now, you can get you know, all the teachings of the Buddha online, and you can just key in a word. Kanika Samadhi, see where it occurs. 
it doesn't occur in the suttas or the Vinaya. And when you understand that samadhi means stillness, it makes no sense. It's an oxymoron. Momentary stillness. Stillness has to have a duration. Okay. Here's one over there. It occurs physical stillness. I know that sometimes I should actually make a little comment on that. I know that sometimes people doing walking meditation, they ask, can you get into that jhana? And I always thought that was totally impossible. But one of the monks from Thailand told me, yeah, he did see this one monk who, when he was walking meditation, could get into stillness. And he knew that because he had so many bumps and cuts on his head. <laughs> In these jhanas, you lose all perception of any of the physical feelings. You can't feel anything. So if you hit a wall, you just go bang. You wouldn't feel it, but you do afterwards. Okay, another one from Here Zoom? Goes. Yeah. Somewhere the Buddha said that he only taught dukkha and the end of dukkha, that suffering and the end of suffering. How did the jhanas lead to the end of dukkha in the rest of life? Oh, that's so easy. It's dukkha and the end of dukkha. This is like a temporary ending of a lot of dukkha. Not total ending, but much of it, like the five sense world. And what that actually does, it tends to make you uh, more respectful of the sixth sense, you know, the mind. Look, this is really weird. I cannot understand why... I was a scientist. Why people are not accepting the existence of a mind, totally separate from the body. And why one of my mates, I'm going to see him next month, uh, Bernard Carr, he was an offsider of Stephen Hawkins, but he's also a Buddhist. Uh, offside, it means he was very close to Stephen. He was a theoretical physics. He was the, the head of theoretical physics at Queen Mary College who came in London. He's just recently retired. He's emeritus now. He's also a Buddhist. And he was telling me even someone like Stephen Hawkins you know, can't accept the existence of a mind independent of the body. That is crazy to me. Sometimes people have such a strong attachment to some of the, the ways of thinking, they cannot see that. Even things Aristotle would always call the six senses. You know, the seeing, hearing, smelling, taste, touch, and mind. And I think this is one of the reasons over 2,500 years that in the West we've lost our common sense which is what Aristotle called the mind. Whatever you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, the mind can know. We've lost our common sense. We've lost our mind. We're far too materialistic. We know nothing about what happens when those five senses vanish. It seems to be the Greeks in that time knew. Yeah. I don't know if that answers it. Um, how yeah. did the jhanas lead to the end of suffering in the rest of life? Does, does that...? Oh, easy. It ends your suffering because a lot of suffering disappears. The heavy, important, the, the biggest part of suffering disappears. Then afterwards, when you understand the, the pleasures of the mind, then that will disappear too. Little by little gets more and more still. What is still will vanish. But is it also due to the fact that jhanas um, are ways of letting go and so a lot of the clinging starts to yeah, towards indeed. the five sense world? I already mentioned to you that uh, Ajahn Brahm can't enter jhana. Ajahn Brahm has to disappear first of all. You have to let go. These are deep stages of letting go and vanishing. And the biggest part of letting go you know, is your sense of control, your attachment to your five senses, and the only thing to let go of now is the knowing, the mindfulness. 
In the fourth jhana that gets so pure and it's still. And when the mindfulness starts to vanish, those become the arupa states. It's the mind vanishing. If things are still, they disappear. So eventually, everything disappears. Everything is subject to vanishing. The whole lot. Nibbana is everything going. Not just, you know, just things, not just five senses, not just body, but all your mind ceasing, gone. And when people argue, ah, what do you want to do that for? Because it's suffering. Beautiful. All right. Um, there is one more in the Zoom. I kind of want to give one more chance to someone here too, but it will probably be brief. Maybe the lady at the back, and I think that will have to be the last one because there's one on here as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. In relation to that, in relation to what you or how someone to distinguish in their own mind between a feeling of not wanting to be and not wanting to suffer or wanting to Yeah. Yeah, how do you distinguish between not what I've just said and not wanting to be, not wanting to suffer? If you don't, any wanting or not wanting is a blockage to the path. This is giving up wanting, totally abandoning wanting. Wanting is a hindrance. This is one of the reasons why, if you want to get jhana, you will never get there. The wanting is the problem. Or not wanting it is a problem. So it's just, it's just meditating here, being at peace with this moment. That's why the first time you experience these jhanas, or even nimittas, they're unexpected. Even Ananda, I love telling this story, a great way to get jhanas. Ananda, he was uh, invited to this big meeting of 500 arahats. He wasn't enlightened yet. So he spent all night trying to meditate, trying to get enlightened. When the dawn came up, he was still at square one, he hadn't got anywhere. So he stopped, he decided he still had an hour before the meeting, he'd go and take a nap. And before his head hit the pillow, he became the 500th enlightened being. So if you're not enlightened yet, take a nap. <laughs> we call that Ananda method of enlightenment. It's very popular, but hardly ever works. All right, uh, mm, let's see, maybe the last one. So how do you overcome strong or negative emotions to achieve jhana? We do have a higher time. Actually. Yeah. Uh, how do you get strong emotions? First of all, you get frustrated that they don't work. You soon realize that those strong or negative emotions are the blockage. This is a path of peace, a path of stillness. You can't get still when you're really emotional. So after a while you close your eyes and the sources of emotions you don't fantasize, you don't remember, you don't think. You just are peaceful and everything settles down. The water becomes still all by itself. Your job is just to be observant, to be mindful and to be kind. Strong emotions do not fit with this refined kindness called metta. There was a question over there, you had your hand up. Nice. Sh shout it out. Um, external senses cease in deep meditation. Yes. I was wondering about internal senses and things like subtle energy in the body that isn't a physical thing. Would that perception also cease? Yes, because the body ceases. Basically, you're not aware of anything in your body at all. That vanishes. Yes, quick. How to orient one's life if you let go of free will and of like. <laughs> Because now you know you don't choose these things. You associate yourself with good people, they influence you. A good example of that, when the Buddha became enlightened, why did he teach? He had no free will to teach. He taught because 
this Sahampati, who was a non-returner, who was also an old friend from his previous life, came and saw the Buddha and said, congratulations, we were in the same village before. Now you're the Buddha, I'm a non-returner. Please teach. Please teach, because there's people in this world with little dust in their eyes. Please teach. If he hadn't have said that, the Buddha would have been a Pacheka Buddha, a Sanam Buddha. Okay. Next one. Well, it's done, actually. You know, I've got five be minutes. Out of here at nine, Ajahn. I'll get out in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, I give up. <laughs> okay. I give up too. <laughs> okay, do you want to make an announcement or whatever? Okay. Okay, so thank you all for coming. I, and thank you for asking these questions. I enjoyed these questions immensely because a lot of times I just end up talking about how to keep a marriage together or the two bad bricks in the wall and how to deal with some of this other stuff in life. This is the sort of stuff I talk with monks about and it's thank you for listening. And if you don't agree with it, I don't care because you will eventually. <laughs> so thank you. But also, uh, I'm only here because of her, because of uh, she. How many bhikkhunis are there in England right now? You give me the one finger sign. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, there's only one bhikkhuni, Theravada bhikkhuni, properly ordained in the whole of England. To me, that's unacceptable. So, please support the Bhikkhuni Sangha here. And please make sure that, you know, in the future, there's many, many women who have the opportunity to ordain, live monastic. I'm not saying that monastic life is for everybody, but at least the opportunity is there for you. At the moment, I think that's wrong. And as a Buddhist, it makes me sort of kind of embarrassed. So hopefully we can have a nice monastery, not just a house in, a, in the street, it's a nice house, but at least we can have a place where more women can come and ordain. A Sangha, just like in the time of the Buddha, the Patachara, Kisa Gotami, these were great women. I was really inspired when I started reading about them. These were people, there were so many of these bhikkhunis, they were meditating and meditating and meditating, getting nowhere. And this great nun, Patachara, came along, just a few days, taught them how to meditate properly, and the more enlightened nuns in this world. I want to see that again. Monks, we've got enough monks, good monks, like the monks in front here. I had lunch with them today, they're great. But really, what Buddhism is missing out on in today's world, especially in UK, is good bhikkhunis. I can teach, I can argue, I can uh, answer questions. This is most I can do. But to actually make the actual place happening, that's for you. So please be generous. You'll never regret it. If you've got a few extra quid in the bank, or euros, I don't know where you come from, please donate it for the nuns' monastery. Then we can get a proper place where she can stay. And you can also stay and ordain. And live the monastic life to the full. <laughs> <laughs> so, just want to say I am in Oxford now. So, uh, many people don't realise that we do do a lot of teaching. So. I heard today that there are all these sutta classes going on in one of the universities, but we have them too, every Friday. So you can join by Zoom or you can come to the Vihara, not this Friday because we'll be teaching, I think, in Oxford again. Um, but after that, weekly, we have, uh, we have some sutta discussions and it's really nice because we apply the teachings to our everyday lives and share about our um, struggles and also our inspiration together. So it's really beneficial, as Ajahn was saying. In fact, it's essential to associate with good people and not only to hear the teachings, but to discuss them as well. The Buddha said that's one of the highest blessings, not only listening, but discussing the Dhamma, because that way we can kind of clarify our own 
understanding and uh, make them come alive. And we have guided meta meditation and lots of other teachings on Zoom. Also on uh, retreats that I teach. I'm going to be doing one for Oxford Insights. Thanks to Catherine here and Isabel as well. Um, and what else? Uh, New Year retreat for Sheffield Insight, 28, 29, 30th. There's still loads of places there. And uh, some other retreats in the US. And you can look on our website, um, anukampoproject.org slash events. Um, Minori's put it in the chat box for the Zoomies as well. So yeah, I really want to encourage all of you to be involved in this, not because it's just for bikunis, although that would be great if, you know, there could be more bikunis <laughs> that it could serve, but really to build a community, because I think that's one of the things that we're missing in society. You know, many people are so lonely, many people are a little bit lost, or maybe they've found the Dhamma and they want to practice, but they just don't have enough support and encouragement around them, you know, and they're looking for spiritual friends, at least that they can kind of keep contact with every so often. So this is why, why a monastery is so special. You know, it's not that you just go on retreat and then you leave the retreat center and that's it. You know, where do you go for support? You can come there any time and you can be part of building the place. You can be part of forming it and bringing some beautiful energy in between those walls. So even though it's only a four bedroom terraced house, which is pretty big deal, really, considering it was all um, acquired on the basis of dana, donations from others, basically, even my walls are a gift, right? Even so, it's full of love and it's full of warmth, and I hope that you can come and experience that. And yeah, our wonderful friends here, the Oxford Buddha Vihara monks, come quite regularly and we visit you as well, and it's starting to feel like a real hub for the Dhamma, so... Thank you, everybody, for your support so far, and I do hope that you'll be in touch. You can write to us at team at anukampaproject.org to book a visit or to come and offer dana for a meal or any other needed items. Um, the reason our, web, our address is not on the website or any public place is because I'm still there alone, and it would just be a little bit, you know, risky maybe, and it's to preserve the peace until we have a bigger place and a bigger community. So it takes a little email, you know, it takes a bit more effort, but then we know you really want to come. So do keep in touch. And uh, what else? I guess we've got more events going on. We have a talk in Bristol tomorrow night. It's a little bit far maybe with the public transport situation. But if any of you get into Jhana tonight, you can Just get there by psychic there. powers. <laughs> 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 so you never know. Sorry? Oh, yeah, that's right. We've got a weekend retreat in Oxford, but it's full. Uh, so we need bigger venues in the future. We have about 135 people coming for the weekend retreat in uh, Ifli Village near our Vihara. And we are live streaming the morning and evening sessions. So that's like 9.30 to 11, I think. And evening, the Q&A, somewhere around 4 or 5 o'clock. 4? Yeah. 4.15. All right. Yeah. So you can be involved and we'll be uploading all these talks to YouTube as well. Anukampa Bikuni Project YouTube channel. So thank you very much for being here. And of course, thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Yeah. Anything else? No, I'll be just going outside. We've got to clear the hall two minutes ago. So if you want to ask any more questions, I'll be just waiting outside. In other words, Ajahn's fired up. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to clear the building too. Yes. So. Yeah. Let's, let's try and get out by half an hour. We don't want to upset them because then they don't invite us back. So, but let's try our best to uh, get out in half an hour. There's leaflets outside as well. Take care. Thank you. Sorry, we can't invite the Zoomies to stick about. <laughs> but hopefully I'll see you soon. Take care, everyone, on Zoom. Here we go. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I'll just leave it? Yep. Sure. All right. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>